Okay, so this is a picture. And somehow this is what I want. So this is a kind of central focus of the talk. This is a picture of a very big dimension, very, very large um, representation of a symmetric group in uh, characteristic seven. Uh, so it's an enormous vector space, and this vector space has a, has a decomposition into pieces, and these pieces are indexed by these little triangles, these alcoves. And here's a zoomed-in picture, so you see that there's these numbers on these alcoves. These are indicating how, many, how often these pieces are occurring. And you can see that at this scale it looks somewhat random, but as you move back out there's clearly some kind of structure there. But it's also clear, if you look closely at this picture, that you're not going to be able to guess the rule. So there's some kind of structure there that seems very beautiful, but also it seems very intricate and somehow rather subtle. Okay. So this is a picture that we couldn't have dreamed of drawing um, seven or eight years ago. So somehow, over the last seven or eight years, our capacity to um, compute and look at any examples of um, representations of symmetric groups has increased enormously, and that's what I want to tell you about. So, as a kind of central guiding theme for this talk, I just want to remind people that mathematics kind of has this incredible efficiency. So if you think about a generating function, you can have a long, long list of numbers, but you can encapsulate them in something very simple. And the same is true of, for example, an L function in number theory, where we package together an enormous amount of arithmetic information into some very compact form very useful form. And similarly, if you think about a differential equation, you plug in some you know, simple initial conditions, and then the whole evolution of the system is determined by this differential equation, or the whole trajectory. And you can also think about similar efficiency for concepts. So the concept of a group, for example, you know, depending on how you count, there's maybe three axioms that encapsulate this incredibly rich object this incredibly rich mathematical object. So you have kind of efficiency of information and efficiency of concept. And you can... So if something's kind of efficiently described, you can also think about that as a generative process. So, for example, a generating function has ge generating in its name. It's a way of, from a very small amount of information, generating a whole lot of very interesting information. Okay, so this is the... Uh, the fecundity of the mathematical world. And I think many of the talks that we've seen in this panorama have demonstrated this fecundity. Okay? So what I want to talk about are these things called higher representations, so they're the kind of analog in category theory of a representation. And these display both these types of fecundity. So higher representations emerged in subjects like geometric Langlands and these kind of very high concept subjects. And so they're very useful um, concept, but they're also very useful from a kind of computational point of view. So I, I underestimate how much information is in a categorical representation. So I will explain what these things are later. Okay. So what we're doing is representation. So I want to. I, I, I'm using higher representations to understand representations. Higher representations are used to understand good old representations, so I need to remind you what good old representations are. So the symmetric group S3, this is the permutations of three elements, and it acts by permutation of coordinates on R3. And if you think about it inside R3, you can look at the sum of the coordinates, and the sum of co sum, so slices with sum of coordinates constant are preserved by this permutation action. There's also this orthogonal axis of uh, span by 1, 1, 1. And so I can break my representation up into two pieces. It's a simple example of a direct sum decomposition. If I project my three coordinate vectors onto this sum of coordinates equal to zero, I get this triangle. And on that triangle, the symmetric group acts as the symmetries of a triangle. So here we see 
um, several nice concepts in representation theory. Firstly, each of these two pieces is a simple representation. So inside, the, inside a two-dimensional space, if I act on it by the symmetries of a triangle, there's no line that's invariant. So this is a simple representation. Also, um, also this representation is semi-simple, so it breaks up into two pieces which are simple. So I'll go over the simple theory of the representations of symmetric groups. So as with any finite group, we can consider a representation of a finite group. This category is always semi-simple. And in the case of the symmetric group, we have a beautiful description of the simple representations in terms of partitions. So here are the partitions of six on the right, all listed down here. So for each one of these partitions, there is a simple representation of the symmetric group, and this is a complete list of all the ways that the symmetric group can act simply on a complex vector space. And we have this beautiful branching rule, which tells us that, so if I have a representation of the symmetric group of, on n letters, I can restrict it to the, uh, to the symmetric group on n minus 1 letters, consisting of permutations which fix, for example, n. And I have this lovely rule that I get as a result, the partitions corresponding to removing a single box from my original, from my um, lambda over here. So for example, if I take this irreducible, this simple module, and I restrict it to SN minus one, there's only one way I can move, remove a box, and so it stays irreducible, it stays simple. And it's very important here that this is a multiplicity one branching, so every simple occurs at most once. And so this whole theory, it's very beautiful, it was worked out four years after Frobenius discovered the character table. So in 1896 in Berlin, he discovered the character table. A year later, he discovered the concept of a representation. And then three years later, he'd already solved the symmetric group, which is pretty impressive. So here's a picture. We can, we can consider all representations of all symmetric groups. So uh, just in terms of parameters, this is just all partitions of any size. And then we connect two partitions when they're connected by the uh, relation of adding or removing a box. So here I can remove this box. Whereas this guy up here that I said branches with multiplicity one, it's connected back here to this one. And in representation theory, enormously important role is played by induction, which is a procedure of going back the other way. So we have restriction, which is an obvious way of taking a representation of SN and producing one of SN minus one. We can also go back the other way. This is called induction. And um, basically, restriction removes boxes and induction adds boxes. And something that's already very beautiful here is if you consider this simple representation and then you restrict it, you get a sum of these three simples. And this is totally canonical decomposition of your vector space. And so now you can take these three simples and restrict them and you, again, get a canonical decomposition. And so you can go all the way back, and you get your big vector space, big high-dimensional vector space, canonically split into lines, okay. corresponding to all the different chains back in the path. And these chains back are what we would call a standard tableau. Okay. And so we get the formula for the dimension of a simple representation of the symmetric group as the number of standard tableau, which is another basic result that we, would, that we love. Okay, so now, so this is a classical story, and now I just want to explain to you how to see this story from the perspective of higher representation theory. So firstly, I need to tell you what higher representation theory is. So in representation theory, what we do is we have a vector space and a collection of endomorphisms of those vector spaces, sorry, of that vector space, satisfying some relations, and we ask, what can we say about the vector space? And it's kind of a surprise that you can say so much. So for example, if you say, um, I have a set, and the symmetric group acts on this set, it's still a very, very difficult problem to classify what your set might be. But if you say, I have a vector space, and the symmetric group acts in a linear way on this vector space, then we have a complete and good understanding of what that vector space could be. So in higher representation theory, we try to copy this approach. So we say, imagine that I have a category, and I have a collection of endofunctors of this category, and some morphisms between these functors. 
So it's extremely important that we add the possibility of these morphisms here, and we ask, what can we say about C? And one thing that I want to emphasize is that somehow studying representation theory is very non-obvious. So Galois explained to us what a group was in about 1830 or something. And then many, many people were thinking about groups before Frobenius had the idea of considering representations. So it took about nearly 70 years before people started studied rep studying representations. And similarly, this idea of trying to kind of understand a category by some kind of symmetry might seem uh, like it's not going anywhere. Okay, so another way of thinking about this is that uh, I just want to emphasize this kind of generative point of view. So if I have a vector space and I have a representation and I have a vector in that representation, then I can apply my elements of the group and generate a whole lot of vectors. So it's kind of generative capacity of a representation. And similarly, in a higher representation, I have kind of much more generative capacity. So, uh, you know, you might think about a higher representation as something that I could take an object and then produce more objects in my category. But I can also, for example, take a morphism between two objects and produce a new morphism. Or I can also act by a morphism. So this F, I can act by this morphism and produce a morphism in my category. So morphisms act on objects, objects act on morphisms, morphisms act on morphisms. So there's a whole lot of kind of generative capacity, and I, and I kind of consistently underestimate how rich this structure is. Okay, so this is this beautiful approach. Um, it first appeared in Russian in around 1995, and then appeared in, um, there was an early translation, and then I think it was, became much more known um, later, around about 2000, is this akunkov vashik approach to the representation theory of the symmetric group. So this is just a, a new look at a very classical theory. So if we take a representation of the symmetric group and we restrict to Sn minus 1, it turns out that multiplication by this element, so each of these elements acts on my representation because I have a representation and I can in particular add them up, and this element commutes with Sn minus 1, and hence um, it provides an endomorphism of this restriction functor. So a simple incarnation of this is that if I have a representation of Sn and I restrict it to Sn minus 1 and break it up into eigenvalues, into eigenspaces under this operator, these eigenspaces will be stable under the Sn minus 1 action. So this is a kind of very basic observation. And somehow the fact that there's just one element here that you need is related to this, I mean, not even related, it's basically equivalent to uh, this multiplicity one branching that I mentioned before. Okay. So this is a very basic observation. And you might think, you know, you might dream that you could, can you generate everything from, from this observation? Not quite. You need also to know what happens when you go down twice, when I restrict back twice. And... Uh, you, you have these endomorphisms that come from fact one, but then there's, there's one thing more you can do. If I, so this Tn, n minus 1 n, commutes with Sn minus 2, and so it also provides an endomorphism. And so here, when I restrict down twice, I don't quite have multiplicity one branching, but I have it controlled by some reasonably simple algebra. So this is called a degenerate affine Hecker algebra. And basically what Akunkov and Vashik pointed out is that these two approaches can be used to build the whole representation theory of the symmetric group. Uh, and just to give you a picture of the way that you do this is that you kind of, you assume that you understand everything here by induction, like, and then this kind of forces the next row on you, and then you keep on going. Okay? And the other thing that's very beautiful about the akunkov vashik approach is it's kind of local. So, Frobenius, when he writes down the, the, when he classifies the irreducible representations of the symmetric group, the simple representations of the symmetric group, he just kind of, he's done enough examples, he knows what the answer should look like, and then he answers it all in one, um, using symmetric functions. And that's great if you can guess what the answer is, but what's really powerful about Akunko Vershek is it's very local, so if I understand what's going on here, then I kind of understand what's going on around me. 
Okay? So you can slowly build up the theory. And this is very powerful because we're about to encounter situations in which we absolutely cannot guess what the answer is from the outset. So this is a little bit of a technical slide, so I'll try to go through it slowly. So firstly, this is something that's very common, is that we put all the representations together. This is the equivalent of just the equivalent of just considering all partitions. And we sum up all the induction and all the restriction functors. So now we just have one category, one enormous category, and it's acted on by induction and restriction. And also, before, I said we have this Juicis Murphy thing, this JM, and this TN, and we can add them up to get endomorphisms. So we have this one big category, this endomorph, this endofunctor of this category, and then um, an, an endomorphism of that endofunctor and an endomorphism of its square. And also, uh, yeah, so E and F are adjoint, and so what that means is that I also get endomorphisms of F and T. And I could also describe these in an elementary way, um, as I did with before. And so we have this restrict, so this is E is the sum of all the restriction functors, and F is the sum of all the induction functors. These both have endomorphisms, and so we can split them up into eigenspaces, basically. So I'm saying eigenfunctors, but basically this means splits it up, split it up into eigen, eigenspaces on every object. Okay? And it turns out that all the eigenvalues are integral. Okay? So we get this decomposition of E and F into these pieces. And this is what it looks like. So there's some combinatorial rule for what... Uh, so whenever I apply one of these um, EAs, uh, I either get an, uh, um, a simple or zero. And there's some combinatorial rule, which I'm not telling you, at, and that you can work out reasonably easily as to what happens. But what is absolutely remarkable here is that if you just take this enormous vector space with these operators, and you work out what relations they satisfy, they satisfy the relations of SL infinity, which is a um, big Lie algebra. And moreover, this is a simple representation of this enormous Lie algebra. Okay? So, it's, I mean, this is another example of the, the fecundity of representation theory. So starting with just this empty set, uh, this, this would be a highest weight vector, I can just, boom, spit out all partitions by declaring that I want a simple representation of that highest weight. Okay. And so this is kind of just, I'm not really sure who this is due to. Um, it was one of these things that just kind of, I think people started to realize that it's kind of like just pattern matching. You know, there's a, some combinatorics for, um, for this basic representation of SL infinity, and there's also uh, combinatorics for representations of symmetric groups, and they match. And it's interesting, so this came out of um, mathematical physics, so KP hierarchy and boson fermion correspondence. <clears throat> so now I want to tell you something that um, I think is really remarkable, which is that you can, you can do a categorical version of this. So this is this theory of uh, categorical representations of Lie algebras. So there's a notion of a, of a categorical representation of Lie algebra. So this is some category with symmetries, such that on the growth and the group, you, you have... Um, a representation of a Lie algebra. Um, but it's, it's more than this. And somehow this theory just allows you to spit out. So before, here I said, we can produce this whole vector space just knowing the highest weight. Here, we can spit out this whole category just knowing a one-dimensional vector space. Which is quite amazing, I think. And I won't say exactly what this means, but uh, what this is, this categorical representation, but it is a category, an endomorphism, and an endomorphism of a square satisfying some conditions. But it's really not that, um, not that scary. So now we want to go on to modular representations. So also, you know, I'm happy if I, I saw some people uh, asking each other, if you want to ask a question, please feel free to. So, 
Now we're going to the world of positive characteristics. So we're working over a finite field or something like this. Uh, so representations are no longer semi-simple, and basically um, all hell breaks loose in very rough summary. Yeah. So we, we still know how many uh, simple representations there are. We, the number of simple representations is the number of p-regular partitions. So p-regular means that no, no part is repeated more than p, p or more times. So for example, here you have the part 1, 1, 1 repeated three times, so this is not allowed. So these are the three regular partitions. Here I have the part 2, 2, 2 repeated three times, so this is not allowed. <clears throat> so we understand how many uh, simple representations there are, but basically, so the branching rule that I wrote down before, it's incredibly complicated. If we want to understand, for example, the dimension, this is incredibly complicated. We have no idea about the dimensions of the simple representations in characteristic P. Okay. And typically, you know, you could approach this this subject by just trying to build simple representations in characteristic P, but that turns out to be very hard. And a better, a better approach is to take something that you know in characteristic zero and reduce it modulo P. So I want to give an example of this. Consider the symmetric group. So the same example as before, but now in characteristic three. So before I said we had this all coordinates equal, sorry, all co so sum of coordinates equal to zero and all coordinates equal, and these were orthogonal, but now, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. And so that says that this line actually lies inside this all co um, sum of coordinates equal to 0 plane. Okay. So you can, so this line lies inside the reduction mod 3 of this uh, coordinate sum to 0 space. So what we would say is we've taken this thing in characteristic 0, we reduce it modulo p, and then. Uh, it um, you know, has non-trivial structure, and we record these in decomposition numbers. So we would say, so, and th this is what we're after. We're, understa we're after understanding what this decomposition behavior looks like. Um, so if you understand how simples decompose when you reduce them modulo p, then you can, for example, um, predict the dimensions of the mod p simples. Okay. So we get a very similar picture before except we have to chuck out the, the non-three regular partitions. And so we get a diagram like this. And although this is a much, much more, much, much more complicated scenario, both theorems that I said before still hold true. So we have the same functors of I restriction and I induction. Now these are, so these are eigenspaces indexed by the field and, and they're integral, so they lie in FP. So we have P of them. So the first miracle is that we still get a simple representation of a Lie algebra, so now we get a simple representation of an affine Lie algebra, SLP hat. And I, this is really remarkable. So um, Date, Miwa, and Jimbo were trying to understand um, conformal, uh, sorry, um, canonical bases in this very like, big infinite dimensional representation motivated by um, like KDV hierarchy, and they came up with these, this beautiful description of this cano canonical basis. And then Thibon here was incredibly interested in this work, and he was talking a lot to Leclerc, and Leclerc was interested in mod P representations of symmetric group, and so they noticed that the combinatorics are, are the same. But it's quite a remarkable observation, I think, now. Um, and the same categorical mir miracle is true. If we consider all these all uh, these categories of representations, then it's a simple module, it's a simple categorical representation of a Lie algebra. So this is what Katarina was talking about. This is this James conjecture. Uh, so this was made by James in 1990 for, um, after these really incredible computations that he did. And when, com so um, what James predicted is that something in characteristic P that we care about is related to something that a priori simpler in characteristic zero. Um, for experts, it's uh, decomposition numbers for Hecker algebras at roots of unity. And then Lascaux, Leclerc, Thibon said that that problem is solvable. This was a conjecture that was proved by Ariki. And so if, you, if James' conjecture is true plus Lascaux, Leclerc, Thibon is true, then there's a 
lovely combinatorial rule that determines the decomposition numbers for symmetric groups. Okay. So this is not the case. Um, so I should emphasize that the LLT conjecture is true. The, the thing that breaks is this James conjecture, the early con earlier conjecture. So there's, I'll summarize as saying this is fundamental arithmetic difficulty in this problem. So an example of what I can prove is that an instance of the James conjecture is true if and only if all prime, div prime divisors of a certain Fibonacci number are less than n squared. Okay? So this Fibonacci number is growing exponentially. Um, and when you see this, you think, might think, well, maybe we're very, very lucky and all of these prime, numbers, prime divisors are small, but they're just not. Okay? So, you know, for example, this is a um, prime Fibonacci number. And also, one believes, one conjectures that um, infinitely many Fibonacci numbers are prime. And there's various um, other ways of formulating this that allow one to get actually, um, you know, concrete uh, statements, like concrete asymptotics from results in number theory. Uh, but anyway, the point of this, this is to say that there is fundamental arithmetic difficulty in representations of the symmetric group, uh, which is, I think, very interesting and, and people didn't suspect was there. But one can still dream, and what, I, what the dream is is that there's some kind of beautiful regularity for large primes, and that there's arithmetic phenomena. For example, you know, is a, is a given Fibonacci number prime or not, or what are the divisors of a Fibonacci number, which we don't expect to be able to answer combinatorially for small p. So I want to explain in the last bit of this talk how to make sense of large and small. So in principle, this makes no sense, yeah? Because if I take a particular symmetric group and I let p be large, then p is just bigger than the order of the group and it's all semi-simple, yeah? uh, But there is a sense in which one can make, uh, one can produce situations in which it looks like there's some kind of regularity for large p. And also, I want to explain how categorical representations, these higher representations, give us an um, enormous capacity to compute way beyond what we could before. So, <clears throat> I distill the problem further. So we decompose into blocks. So these are the... Uh, so, in, in representation theory in general, you can ask kind of which representations speak to each other and break them up. If they don't speak to each other, they live in different blocks what I'm doing here. And one beautiful part of this theory is that these blocks are actually the weight spaces in this categorical representation. So there's the principal block, uh, which is, in general, in uh, representation theory, this is the most um, complicated piece of the representation theory. And typically, uh, you try to understand the principal block first, but sometimes you might be unlucky and there's still a lot to understand outside the principal block. But this is not the case for symmetric groups. If you can solve the principal block, you can solve everything. Now, this is the bit where I have to wave my hands. And basically say that out of these principal blocks, one can do some cooking and produce a very interesting category, which um, I'm denoting rep less than or equal to L. So, I won't say what this is. Uh, basically, what we do is we look at all the principal blocks and they kind of, they stabilize in a certain sense, and then we get some very interesting category out of that stabilization. And these, sta these, these um, categories precisely control the principal, so it's, there's, this is a lossless procedure going to these, these categories. So if we understand these for all L, we've understood all representations of symmetric groups. So this uh, controls, so another way of thinking about this is that I've been presenting this diagram where I have kind of symmetric groups as the columns, and so I'm indexing, I'm kind of sorting partitions by um, the n that they're a partition of. But another way of sorting partitions is by sorting them by how many rows they have. And we're doing that kind of translation here. So again, this is the, has a, um, action of a very, very interesting algebra of endofunctors, this Hecker category. The index, the indecomposable objects are indexed by dominant alcoves in an affine arrangement. 
and it's the correct setting to talk about large P. Okay? So I won't uh, give you any points for guessing what inspired this picture. <laughs> so, I mean, this is just um, extreme poetic license, and I apologize. Um, here's this, this big complicated thing, um, the, my category rep, and it has these, uh, category, these, these symmetries, E and F, and then out of it, what we distill something which is, genuine, which is genuinely self-similar. Okay? And I'll explain that in a second. Um, so in some sense, like there's some, you know, you have this big object and we're distilling something out of it, um, which is this rep, and this has an interesting action of, um, of some functors. And so less poetically, the objects in this category are indexed by dominant outcomes. So this, um, this new object, has, has objects indexed by dominant outcomes. And here I'm showing you all of the um, four, I guess that's a partition of 12. So in the principal block of S12, here are um, some uh, partitions. And um, I'm telling you how these partitions correspond to alcoves in this picture. Okay? So from now on, I'm going to draw these alcoves and you have to believe me that this is telling me some, it's, it's telling me some information about this category, um, rep less than or equal to L. Yeah. So, this is where it gets a bit heavy. Uh, so, localization, this rep category, so this is um, what I, I was working on at the end of my time in Bonn. Uh, Basically, one can take this category, it deforms over a polynomial ring, and then one can localize it. So it's a little bit like in commutative algebra, often you try to understand a module by localizing it, and here we're trying to understand a category by localizing it. And it turns out when you localize it, it becomes very simple, it just becomes a whole lot of um, sums of projective modules over a very simple ring. And so you can try to describe everything here in terms of things over here. And so I implemented this, and basically what happens here is that we use this philosophy of higher representation theory to describe this thing that we want to know inside something that's very simple. So I wrote this down and then ran it for about um, seven or eight months on the MPI supercomputer, and we got much, much more, uh, many, many more decomposition numbers than had ever been computed before. Um, probably like two orders of magnitude or something like that, beyond what was currently, what was possible at the time. And uh, I stared at this stuff. It was literally just like staring at the output of a computer for uh, six months with Lustig, and we arrived at this billiards conjecture. And it's really remarkable that somehow now when I look at this, it's absolutely clear what's going on, but it really took us six months of just staring at these pictures to try to work out the right way to look at it. I just want to show you a quick video of this. Um, this conjecture. Oh, my screen has changed. Okay, should I just try and plug it in and hope? That's always a good, good approach, isn't it? Great. Okay. So th this is some dis distillation of this alcove picture, um, but basically the whole the whole thing seems to be determined by this kind of billiards bouncing and alcoves. But I think totally remarkable. So, at, you know, it's just amazing that in mod P representations of symmetric groups, there appears to be some kind of billiard dynamics. Yeah? Uh, and so, it, this will loop again soon. So, this, I sh like the first second of this picture was what was known prior to our computations. And the first, like, six or seven seconds is actually computed. And then beyond that, it's conjectural. Okay. Uh, I'll just show you one more time. Uh, okay, so now. Yippee. Uh, so, so we got, got to this billiards conjecture. conjecture. And, and then, then uh, it's very, very interesting because, because you know, I'm a very, very bad programmer, so th this, this took eight months. months. But, but when, when good programmers, programmers um, started, started working on this, this <laughs> you get eight months on Zoom, you know, one day on a laptop, yeah? 
But what is also interesting, in my defense, is that one actually can't get much further than, um, than the supercomputer got. It got the, so my code was very bad, but it, it got there eventually. Uh, and when you improve the code enormously, make it much faster, it doesn't get that much further. It got a little bit further, um, enough for Torga to notice that Lustig and I had made a small mistake. So he has a correction to our conjecture, which is the current kind of believed version of our conjecture. Uh, but, but the, the issue, issue is kind of remarkable. remarkable. So I, I, we, we, I was, I was doing, doing multiple runs of this software, and then at some, and we're always getting stuck at the same point. point. And, and then, then I, w you know, I'm trying, trying to look at look what's wrong. wrong. And, and then uh, I work out that. So, so basically, what what, what we're doing is trying to multiply and manipulate an enormous number, millions of um, small matrices with rational coefficients. So at the end of that, it's very simple. You just have these like. Um, like, like li literally, literally millions of matrices, matrices but there might be a five by five matrix, matrix of rational numbers. And I, I was just totally mystified at what was killing the computation. And then at some point I was talking to this magma guru in Sydney called Alan Steele, and he was just profiling and he said, well, you know, why are you calling big int? Um, and I didn't know what that meant. Um, but what it, what it means is that these, the entries in these matrices are rational numbers with hundreds of digits. Okay. So, so it's multiplying them and, and then trying to do GCDs of, um, of enormous, enormous integers. Okay. And so, so it's kind of, you know, I thought the GCD is probably a, ve it's a very, very cheap thing for a computer to do, but somehow these numbers are so big that GCD was killing the computation. And I spent many, many, many hours trying to work out how to get around this large integers issue. And the answer, I think, is very beautiful. So this is not yet implemented, uh, but it's basically the staying characteristic P. So uh, this is, here we have our, this category, and it it's deforms over this polynomial ring. We'd like to understand this thing. And then we try to understand it by localizing it. And I noticed um, like many years ago that when we localize this in characteristic P, it's not, it, somehow what comes out is rather, rather um, it's just a total mystery to me. Um, but Huzzy in 2017 wrote this remarkable paper, so he's a PhD student in Cambridge, and he explained that if you do this in a very analogous situation, this thing breaks up into some number of copies of itself. And then um, I can now prove this statement using um, Smith theory, or um, Smith Truman theory, and it's basically the self similarity of an infinite dimensional space. So there's some infinite dimensional space, has a circle action. When, when I, I take, take fixed points, points under um, Z mod PZ inside the circle, it splits up into some number of copies of itself. So That's a really remarkable uh, self-similarity. And so, it, I, you know, in this poetic analogy, um, when we do this cooking, so this thing is not self-similar, as we learned in Laura's talk. Uh, but when we do this cooking, we can produce this thing that's genuinely self-similar. So another, another less, more, more prosaic, prosaic way of seeing this self-similarity self is if you think about affine vial groups, they have many copies of themselves inside, inside which is tr tr I'm, I'm trying, trying to illustrate this here. So this is this um, kind of self-similarity theorem, and it should have, I think, conceptual and computational consequences. One thing that I think is very beautiful here is that one can kind of imagine recursively building these categories by, so we'd like to know what the, this side is, and we can assume that it's known in some, so that some small piece is known, and then we take a whole lot of copies with itself, and then describe a bigger piece inside, and then we can iterate. So it seems um, incredibly kind of fecund. So this raises many questions. So there's this very interesting proposals of Lustig about generations, which is basically that um, somehow different powers of P in modular representation theory. There should be some kind of self-similarity under different powers of P, and if you look at these pictures, you don't really see, like the self-similarity appears to be there, but it's rather subtle. And I, I kind of suspect that this will end up answering what this um, self-similarity is about. And um, obviously, Frobenius is somehow hiding in the background. And there's been rumors of connections to height in homotopy theory, uh, but somehow no one can, up until now, has been able to make that precise. And so I think that, um, 
this has the potential of finally, re fi fi finally answering whether there is actually something going on. Uh, so this is connected to these Marava K theories that showed up in uh, Muhammad's talk. So uh, thank you very much. So, I, so here's the zoomed out version of this picture. So this is an enormous uh, representation, and this is still conjectural. So we know it up to about here or something. But I think that once I implement this uh, mod p version, it should actually be able to compute up to this kind of range, um, which I think will be extremely interesting. And thank you. And I'd also like to thank these people for these um, very amazing contributions to the code and also to some of the images that I've used. So thank you.